We're going to move now a little further in Revelation chapter 8. We began Revelation chapter 8 again looking for the revelation of Jesus. And we're going to move now into the latter part of Revelation chapter 8, a message called the seven thunders. It's still going to be a gospel emphasis. Remembering this, in Revelation chapter 10 where the seven thunders are mentioned, that whole chapter is an outline of the Millerite movement and the bitter disappointment. I'm accepting that we all agree with that, we all know that. I'm not disparaging that because I'm skipping it over, skipping over it. I'm simply honing in on something else that's there that is as significant, if not more significant, in our message. Something that we've missed, perhaps, and that we need to understand in the context of the gospel. Okay? So, the revelation of Jesus, Revelation chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, we have the seven trumpets. They begin with a prelude of hope, which emphasizes righteousness by faith. How so? Well... If you look at the the picture of the angel and the incense, you recognize it's the sacrifice of Jesus from the cross being mingled with our prayers, and therefore our prayers are acceptable to God. There's no one here that is righteous enough to stand before God without Jesus, without a mediator. So that's the picture that you get. Now, that is contrasted in the history of the trumpets. What do I mean by that? If you look at the history of the trumpets, this is what you're going to find. Now, this first one is controversial, but the fall of Judaism, first trumpet, Uriah Smith believed it was the fall of the Roman Empire. We understand that when the Jews gave themselves to Caesar, we have no king but Caesar at the crucifixion of Christ, they became part of the Roman Empire. When Jerusalem fell, it was a part of the Roman Empire that was falling. How so? Because the Romans didn't want that temple destroyed. They had embellished it. They put money into it. They didn't want it destroyed. So we begin with the destruction of Jerusalem as part of the the seven trumpets. Then we go into the fall of paganism, second trumpet, Romanism, third through fifth trumpets, uh, rise and fall, Islam, fifth and sixth trumpets, atheism in Revelation chapter 11. Every one of these isms has one thing in common, creature merit. So what we see here in Revelation seven trumpets is a contrast between the opening picture of Christ and his righteousness, his merits, contrasted with Judaism, paganism, Romanism, Catholicism, uh, Islam, and atheism. All of these systems have developed a righteousness by work mentality. Islam. You pray, you go to Mecca, etc. Even atheists will say, well, I don't go to church. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm a good person. I live a decent life. I do good to other people. Every single ism outside of Christianity is based on righteousness by works. Christianity is the only system that encourages us to put our complete trust, not in ourselves, but in Jesus for salvation. We can't do it. We're not good enough. We'll never be good enough, but we trust in the righteousness of Christ. So that's the first point that we see here. Then we move across Revelation to chapter 10. Now, chapter 10 is what I call an interlude of hope, again focusing on righteousness by faith. It's a righteousness by faith interlude. We had a prelude, then we have an interlude. It comes right in the middle. Chapter 10 takes us back to righteousness by faith. How so? Well, this interlude is focusing on Jesus and what he's accomplished for us on the cross. Let's take a closer look at it. It's really powerful. It's an additional picture of God's grace given during a pause in the vision that is designed to strengthen our faith as we encounter the truths the vision reveals. We've got all these isms. We've got all this history. Let's get back to Jesus. Now, I just want to say this, and I can try and say it in two ways. One is, the job of the preacher is to make it across, Calvary, across country to Calvary as fast as possible. The job of each one of us as a witness is to lift up Jesus as fast as possible. In other words, as, as the quicker we get to Jesus and the more we are with Jesus, the more powerful our witness is going to be. And this is the way it works in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a blueprint for evangelism. You start with Jesus. You start with his love. You get your focus on Jesus. Then Jesus takes you through this journey. He shows you history. He shows you events that are going to happen, events that have passed. But he keeps, brings you back to him time and time again. You always come back to center. Jesus is center. You come back to him and his righteousness. And when you do that, you have something with which to gauge truth. For example, Revelation 14, three angels' messages. First angel's message. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Same with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of judgment has come, and worship him. And the second angel followed, saying what? Babylon has fallen. How does Babylon fall? 
The only way Babylon falls is if the gospel is preached. The gospel has to be preached in order for Babylon to fall. You can't bring Babylon down by identifying Babylon. Because as soon as you identify Babylon as an institution, we feel safe because we're in this one and not that one. Babylon is a principle that is against the gospel. So that's why the second angel follows the first. So the second angel is predicated by the message of the first. In other words, the only way that we can understand what Babylon is and that we can allow it to fall is by identifying the gospel. Are you following me? Once we identify what the gospel is, and once we understand the gospel, once we're centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then Babylon falls. Otherwise, Babylon is going to be alive in our hearts as well as in the hearts of others that are, that are in other institutions. But we're still in a system of works unless we understand the gospel. So that's why it's very important when we do evangelism not simply to identify Babylon as an institution and move people from that institution to this institution. We've got to identify Babylon as a false gospel. And we've got to introduce people to Jesus, not just to a set of doctrines. Otherwise, we're just bringing the principles of Babylon into our church. The gospel is preached. Jesus is the center. It comes back to him over and over again. And we will only ever understand truth in the context of Jesus. Okay, so when we look at Revelation chapter 10, this is what we have to do. We have to find Jesus. Where is Jesus in Revelation chapter 10? I saw another, still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was upon his head. It says that his head was like his, uh, excuse me, his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. Who is this? It's Jesus. This is Jesus in a glorified form. Just like he came to Daniel in Daniel 10 and John in Revelation chapter 1. He's coming to John again in Revelation chapter 10. His face is like the sun. Okay, so, and he had a little book, what? Open. Anyone know what that book is? It's a little book and it's open. The book of Daniel. It's the only little book that was ever sealed. Now it's open. Sealed, open. And this little book opened in his right hand, in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and he cried with a... Loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And I, about, about three things we want to identify here. Little book, seven, and thunders. Okay? We know the little book is Daniel because it's the only book that was ever sealed up. The only little book, minor prophet, that was ever sealed. And Daniel was told it wouldn't be sealed up forever. It would be opened, it would be unsealed sometime in the future at a place called the time of the end. Okay? So we know it's the book of Daniel. Also, we know seven symbolizes, represents complete or perfect. On the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. So, and then we know thunder represents the voice of God. We looked at that in an earlier meeting. Point is this. Little book is Daniel. Seven represents complete and perfect, and thunder represents God speaking. We're trying to identify what this message is. This is a message from the book of Daniel, when it's opened, it's a message from the book of Daniel that is complete and perfect. It is a message from God that is complete and perfect in the book of Daniel. A lot of people don't know what the seven thunders are. And they're trying to say the seven thunders, you know, there are these events or the seven thunders are these future things that are going to happen. And the seven, no, the seven thunders, biblically speaking, are a message from God that is complete and perfect. That's what it is, the seven thunders. And so John in, in uh, Revelation chapter 10, is given this message. God's voice reveals this perfect, complete message from the book of Daniel. It's open. John hears it, and he gets ready to write it out. See? He's ready. He's, he's heard it. He's heard the message of the seven thunders. It's symbolic to us. All we hear is seven thunders. Remember when God sp spoke, and God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased? And the people that stood by said, oh, that was thunder. You see? But Jesus said, no, that was God saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. When John hears the message of the seven thunders, you know what he says? Oh, that is, and he starts to write. We say, oh, it's thunder. It sounds like thunder because it's symbolic. But it's a perfect message from the book of Daniel, and John's about to write it. What happens when he begins to write it? Now, when the summer's seven thunders utter their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, what? Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Isn't that amazing? God comes to John, opens this book of Daniel, he hears this message, he's excited about it. Whoa, I've got to write this. And then God says, or the voice from heaven says, don't write it, seal it up. Like, what? What's, what's the deal? 
I mean, the book of Daniel was already sealed. Daniel didn't understand it. He was sick about the fact that he didn't understand it. And we know that um, Daniel was given skill and understanding concerning this message that was sealed up. Who gave him that skill and understanding, by the way? Gabriel. God did, but Gabriel came to give him skill and understanding of the message. Do you think that we could ask for the same skill and understanding and God would give it to us today? I believe he will. I believe that he will. And then we go back to the book of Revelation, and we hear, now this is so powerful, Revelation chapter 10, verse 8, then the voice which I heard from heaven, the one that said, seal up the book, spoke to me again and said what? Go and take the little book. Now, here's the interesting part. Why would God tell John not to write a message that he heard in the book of Daniel? Wasn't time? That's a good, that's a good answer. Why would, let me repeat this now, why would God tell John not to write a message, not to write out a message that he heard in the book of Daniel? Okay, let's look at it. Then I heard the voice which I then I then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, "Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth." And I went unto the angel and I said unto him, "Give me the little book." And he said unto me, "Take it and eat it." Why would God tell John not to write a message that is in the book of Daniel? Why would God tell John, don't write, don't write. The voice comes from heaven, don't write it. Then what does he tell him to do? Go and take the little book and eat it. The message is already written, right? It's already written. You don't need to write it out again. What do you need to do? You need to go and take the message that's already written and you need to eat it. You need to consume it. You need to take it in. It's already written. You can write it again and again and again. and again. There's no need to write it again, John. I know you're excited, but what I want you to do as an example of this, what I want you to do is I want you to eat. I want you to consume the message that's already written. Does it make sense? See? The voice says, don't write it. And then he says, go and take the little book and eat it. It'll be what? It'll make your belly bitter, but in your mouth it shall be what? As sweet as honey. And it was. And what was this message that this movement went to the book of Daniel and 8? What, was it, what, what specific prophecy was it that caused this experience? It was the prophecy of the 2200 days, wasn't it? That was the prophecy. So I believe the seventh thunder message is centered in the 2200 day prophecy. In the history and in a, a little bit more concerning that prophecy that perhaps we haven't fully understood. Something more that has to do with righteousness by faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's take a closer look. Jeremiah, by the way, tells us, Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Jesus tells us, man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, it's not good enough for us to simply know intellectually what the Bible says. It's got to be part of our system. It's got to be part of our fabric. We have to put our full weight of trust on the Word of God. Eat them so they become part of our being. You know, you are what you eat. We want to eat the Word of God. All right. So he took the little book out of the hand of the angel, and he ate it. And it was sweet as honey in his mouth. And when he had eaten it, his stomach was bitter. And we know that to be the bitter disappointment of 1844. But I want to look a little bit further here at this prophecy because I believe that there's something in this prophecy that perhaps we've missed that is a powerful illustration of righteousness by faith. Gabriel explains the prophecy to Daniel. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Daniel 9, 24. So they've got 70 weeks that are determined. That means cut off, set aside, specifically allotted to the Jews. Seventy weeks, 490 years of prophetic time are allotted to the Jews. In that time, they need to accomplish seven tasks. Note the number. For your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity. Two, that's three. 
Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision. Five, seal up the prophecy and anoint the most holy. How many tasks is that? Seven, all right? By the way, I believe that's the seven thunders of Revelation chapter 10. Let's get into more detail on this. So they're given 70 weeks or 490 years to accomplish these seven tasks. Now I divided seal up the vision and the prophecy because I believe these are two different applications of the same thing. And we'll look at that in a little bit here in, in a second. But notice, finish transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. The Jews had 70 weeks or 490 years to accomplish this. Did they do it in the allotted time? No, they didn't do it. They didn't accomplish it. Second question, were they supposed to? The prophecy says that 70 weeks are allotted for you to finish transgression, make an innocent. Were they supposed to finish transgression, make an innocent, make reconciliation, for, bring in everlasting? Were they supposed to accomplish those seven tasks in that allotted time? It's kind of a trick question. I know, I talked you into saying, I talked you into saying yes. And most commentaries on this prophecy will allot at least one or two of these tasks to the Jews. They were supposed to do it, but they didn't. But I want you to notice how the prophecy itself reads. You've got 70 weeks. Now here's the next verse. Know therefore and understand. Since you have 70 weeks to accomplish these seven tasks, know therefore and understand. Now notice this, that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, who's that? Jesus. Shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. How much is seven weeks and threescore and two weeks? Now, all my seniors knew what a score was. How many years is in a score? 20. So what's threescore? 60. Seven weeks is 67 and two weeks is 69. Is that 70 weeks? No. Okay, think about this. The Jews had 70 weeks to perform these tasks. So they needed to know and understand that Messiah was coming in 69 weeks. Why? Because according to the gospel, according to the principle of righteousness by faith, Jesus is the only one that can accomplish these tasks. We can't do it. The Jews couldn't do it. They thought they could do it. They believed they could do it. But it was impossible for them to do it. Any of it. None of it could be accomplished by Jesus. And this is what John was seeing. He was looking at this prophecy in the book of Daniel. And he was going, whoa, the seven thunders. I get it now. When Messiah came, our job was to accept him. Because he's the only one that could fulfill this prophecy. That's why the prophecy says that he was going to come in 69 weeks. Because these tasks had to be accomplished before the 70 weeks were finished, and they were accomplished by Jesus. Are you seeing that? See, the whole focus now of the 2300-day prophecy is Jesus. In fact, I would like to suggest that Jesus Christ, being the center of the 2300-day prophecy, is where we need to date the 2300-day prophecy. In, instead of going back to 457, we need to go to A.D. 31. Because you know you can prove that biblically. You can prove the exact year from the Bible, according to Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 3. You can prove the exact year from the Bible, the 13th year of the, year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. You can prove that. You can Google that. You can find out that the 13th year of Tiberius Caesar was 27 A.D. You can show that from the Bible. And in 27 A.D., Jesus was baptized or anointed. That's what the Messiah means, the anointed one. And if you go from 27 A.D. backwards, you go back 69 weeks, 483 years, you know what date you come to? 457 B.C. From A.D. 27, you go to 457. Now there's some controversy about that. Obviously, some people believe Jesus was crucified in A.D. 33 or A.D. 30. Or 8, but the truth of the matter is, is that you can prove A.D. 27 as the baptism date. You can go back to 457. You can prove it right from the Bible. In other words, you can center the 2300-day prophecy in Jesus. And if you want to argue those dates and argue that prophecy, that period, you're going to have to find another Messiah because he's the only one that can finish transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness. He's the only one that seals up the vision and the prophecy and anoints the most holy. He's the only one that can do that. And he did it all before 
the 70 weeks ended before 70 AD, or 34 AD. Let's take a closer look at this. It's so powerful to me. Jesus Christ is the only one who can finish transgression and make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision, the prophecy, and anoint the most holy. And by the way, vision and prophecy are two different things. Vision and prophecy are two different things. One is talking about the length. The other is talking about the application. Who it applies to and from whence it starts and whence it ends. Two different things, but both of them applying to Jesus. Jesus is the only one that fulfilled the conditions of that prophecy, and he's the only one that it applied to from 457 going all the way through 1844. Okay, 70 weeks determined on thy people to finish transgression. That word finish means to shut up transgression. Here's a prophecy in Psalm 88. Verses 4 and 5, I am as a man that has no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, they are cut off from my hand. This psalm is talking about Jesus and his experience at Calvary. In fact, A.T. Jones once recommended that you read the psalms as if they were prophesying of the life and death of Jesus Christ, and you will get a tremendous blessing from doing that. We have a little book put together on that called Evidences of Love. Read the Psalms as they were, they were prophesying of the life and death of Jesus. And you're going to find so many times there are insights in the Psalms because most of them were written, a lot of them were written by David, who had a heart after God's own heart, who was like God, who, who was the son of David. Jesus was the son of David. Many of them that David experienced, many of them are prophetically speaking of the experience of Jesus. He was cut off. He felt like he was remembered no more, cut off from God. Notice it says, you've laid me in the lowest pit in darkness in the deeps. Your wrath lies hard upon me. Jesus experienced the wrath of God that you have put me away from my acquaintances. Uh, you put them far from me. You've made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up. That's the same word, finish. I am shut up and I, can come, and I cannot come forth. Jesus took the sins of the world upon him and he, and he was shut up in those sins. Sin was finished in him. I'm going to finish transgression in Jesus Christ. He became sin for us, in other words. Second part of the prophecy. Notice what it says. Make an end of sins. That's exactly what Hebrews says happened with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He's made an end of sin. Next part of the prophecy says he would make reconciliation for iniquity. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 5. For when we were yet without strength in due time, and that is referring to the 2300 day prophecy, by the way. That word due time means set time, appointed time. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. He'll make reconciliation for iniquity. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more... Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Those are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. And then it says he will bring in everlasting righteousness. The righteousness is found in the gospel. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed from right, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last. The just as is written, the just shall live or the righteous shall live by faith. And the everlasting gospel, of course, Revelation chapter 14. So this everlasting righteousness is the everlasting gospel, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what he established. He replaced the righteousness of man with his righteousness. The Pharisees, the scribes, anyone and everyone who wants to climb to heaven somehow merit heaven by their own works has to be confronted with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm the truth, the way, and the life. I'm the only way. There's salvation under no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. It's righteousness by faith in Jesus. And, of course, it says he would seal up the vision and the prophecy. I believe that that applies vision to the content, Christ, and prophecy to the placement, 457 to 1844. And finally, he would, uh, excuse me, we have a short, more sure word of prophecy. He would anoint the most holy. Now, this is talking specifically about the heavenly sanctuary. When Jesus was crucified, he lay in the tomb, he was resurrected, and he said to Mary, don't detain me, I must go to my father. He went to his father, his sacrifice was accepted, and immediately he began his work as mediator. In fact, he began it before he even left. In John 17, he began to pray for his disciples and in intercede in their behalf. And so he went to heaven, and he anointed the heavenly sanctuary. He began his work in the holy place. We've looked at that in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, churches, seals and trumpets, all of those visions begin in the holy place with the candlesticks, the candlesticks, the candlesticks and the golden altar, all holy place. And then at the end of this prophecy, we're told, he would 
cleanse the sanctuary, which was reference to the Day of Atonement, the final cleansing, he would move to the final phase of ministry into the most holy place. How do we know that? It's so clear when you follow the sanctuary symbolism. Just follow it through Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Jesus is clothed with a garment down to the foot. He's clothed like the high priest, and he's in the candlesticks. That's holy place. Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The seven lamps of fire are burning. That's holy place. Revelation chapter 8. The golden altar is in the holy place. Revelation chapter 9. I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar. That's holy place. By the way, that's 1840. That prophecy in Revelation 9 is 1840, the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Still holy place. Still pre-1844. Then you move in to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, 19, John says, I saw the temple of God open in heaven, and I saw the ark of his testament. You know what that is? Most holy place. All of a sudden now, we've moved from the holy place to the most holy place. And guess what? You know what's in the ark of his testament? What's in the ark of his testament? The Ten Commandments. You know the Ten Commandments are never mentioned, I mentioned this earlier, the Ten Commandments are never mentioned in Revelation 1 through 12. 1 through 11, I want to clarify that. They're not mentioned until after we get into the most holy place. And then after we see the ark in the most holy place, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, I saw a people who keep the commandments of God. That's the first time it's mentioned. The commandments of God is holy place language. The ark of the Testament is holy place language. Mo excuse me, most holy place language, most holy place language. So now Revelation has moved into the most holy place. The second half of the book of Revelation is primarily post-1844. We've moved into the most holy place. We've come to the end of the 2300-day prophecy. And we moved into the final phase of Christ's ministry. And now we start seeing the most holy place language, the Ark of the Testament, the Ten Commandments, most holy place language. You don't see that in the first half of Revelation. You see it in the second half. So if you just followed the sanctuary imagery, you would know exactly where you were in history, just following the symbols. I know this is going above some of your heads, but we've got the outlines. You can study it. We've got a lot of studying to do, don't we? You know, I'm coming here, I'm giving you all these sermons, you're like, oh, I got all these sermons, I'm fed, I'm ready. No, all these sermons are, I got to go and study this. Man, I got to go and study this. 140,000, are you sure? I got to go and study that. I'm not going to take what he says. And you know, I love that. I love it. Because you are not going to stand on James Rafferty said, but God, James Rafferty told me the 144,000 was, was a symbolic number. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're going to have to know what you believe from the Word of God. You're going to go back and study it for yourselves. Do it, I did it. It's a great I mean, this is the thing that drives us to the Word of God, that shuts off the television, that, that turns us away from all the things of the world, the distractions of the world, and gets us honed in, you know? These are the challenging things that God brings to us through His messengers so that we can go back to the Word of God and we start digging and start looking for ourselves. And that's what we need to do. Powerful stuff. But remember, it's all centered in Jesus. It's all centered in Jesus. So, Jesus goes into the heavenly sanctuary, anoints it for service. That's what would happen in the earthly sanctuary. Exodus tells us, Exodus 30, 20, 26, and thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its vessels, the candlestick, the vessels, the altar of incense, the altar burnt offering, all the vessels in the labor. By the way, when this, before the sanctuary service was, was started in the, in the earthly sanctuary, the high priest went in and anointed everything in the holy place and the most holy place. Some people say, Jesus went into the most holy place when he ascended. If he did, it was simply to inaugurate it. But he began his ministry in the holy place. If you look to the book of Hebrews to prove that he went in the most holy place, you're not going to find it there in the Greek. The evidence for it's not there. Paul in the book of Hebrews is not arguing about holy and most holy place. That's not even in his brain. He is arguing earthly sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary, earthly sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary. He only uses the phrase most holy place, hagion, hagion, once. And that's when he's talking about the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. Every other time it's hagion, it is talking about the sanctuary, the holy, but it's talking about the heavenly one versus the earthly one. So the book of Revelation is giving us an outline of Christ's ministry. The reason why he steps into the holy place and not the most holy place is because the earth wasn't ready for him to finish it up prior to 1844. Why? Because the sanctuary had been obscured. Darkness was upon the face of the earth for 1260 years. People even didn't, didn't even have Bibles. They didn't know anything about a heavenly priest. Most people went to the earthly priest. It was complete fabrication and misrepresentation of the gospel. And so it wasn't until after that that the light came and people began. And even me, you know, here I am, 1984, and I'm still going to my earthly priest. Not until I 
uh, realize that I have a heavenly priest. You see, so people are still in darkness about that. Jesus isn't going to wrap it up until the light has gone to the world. And that's why we're living in the most holy place. We're living in the end of time. And we need to tell people, you've got a priest in the heavenly sanctuary. He's in the final phase of ministry there. He's closing it up. He's getting ready to return. He wants to make that final cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. So the table, everything was anointed for service from the beginning to the end all the way through. Outer court was phase one. Jesus comes to the earth, he dies at Calvary. Holy place was phase two. That's where he stayed until 1844. Now we're in phase three. We're in the most holy place. We're in the final phase of ministry before Jesus returns to this earth. This is what the Bible says. It's very clear. Hebrews 9.24. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true. He entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God in our behalf. Verse 19 of Hebrews 10. Therefore, my friends... Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, and I'm giving the correct um, translation there, because some translations of this is the most holy place. No, it's the sanctuary. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10, 22. This then is what John saw. He saw the book of Daniel opened, and he saw that it was Jesus who finished transgression, made an end of sins, made reconciliation for iniquity, brought in everlasting righteousness, sealed up the vision, sealed up the prophecy, and anointed the most holy. And he was ecstatic. He was like, man, i got to write this out. The angel says, don't write it, don't write it, oh, don't write it. It's already written. As an example to those who will follow you, go and take the book of Daniel, take it and eat it. Oh, you're going to love the message. It's going to be sweet. You're going to go through a bit of disappointment, but you're going to go back through that disappointment. You're going to realize the sanctuary isn't the earth. It's in heaven. And Jesus is mediating there. And he's the one that's fulfilled all these covenant promises. Because we can't fulfill promises. It doesn't matter how many men you get together in football stadiums all over the United States. We're not promise keepers. We're not promise keepers. God is the promise keeper. The new covenant is based on his promises to us, not our promises to him. Our promises are like ropes of sand. But he promises he's going to do it. He's going to put his law in our hearts and minds. So we won't want to steal. We won't want to commit adultery. We won't want to break his Sabbath. We won't want to have other idols before him, other gods before him. And he's going to cleanse our iniquities and transgressions. We're going to be his, his people. He's going to be our God. We won't need other men to teach us because we'll have an anointing from the Holy One. He'll teach us all things. Not that it isn't significant and important to have apostles and teachers and pastors and preachers, but you don't have to rely on me. See, because God's teaching you. You have a relationship with Jesus. You open your Bibles. You can read it. You can study it for yourselves. I'm just giving you a little bit of spark. I'm encouraging you. Go check it out. But you don't need to rely upon what I say. In fact, it would be fatal for you to rely upon me for your salvation. You've got to rely on your own relationship with Jesus and the Word of God for yourselves. And I know you're going to do that. So he sealed up the vision, the prophecy, anointed the most holy. He did it all. This is what we need to know and understand. Know, therefore, and understand it. Do you know and understand it? He did it all. From the time of the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. God has given us this powerful prophecy. John saw it and now we see it. This is the fuller, I think, revelation of Jesus Christ. Fuller understanding of righteousness by faith. Trusting in Jesus for our salvation. We are going to have a better understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation. Revelation, they're going to start into action forces that can't be repressed. They're going to impress us with the character that we need to develop. They are going to compel us to go forth and share it with others. Because this is good news. This is wonderful good news. And as we share it with others, it's going to tie in with all of the historicist prophecies, all of the history that we've understood as a people for years. It's all going to come together, and it's going to be centered in Jesus. Let Daniel be studied, let Revelation be studied, but with everything, let it be studied in connection with the phrase, the verse, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm just quoting, 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 just sharing with you statements that have spurred me on to study Revelation with a completely different focus as the revelation of Jesus Christ. Study Revelation in the seven thunders in the context of what Christ has done for us. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you again for this message of righteousness by faith, it opens in the trumpets with a picture of Jesus' mediation. It closes in the thunders with a picture of what he's accomplished for us in that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. It opens in Revelation 1 with a picture of his love and the freedom he's given us by his blood. It closes 
in Revelation chapter 22 with, a, with an invitation. Let him that is a thirst come and drink freely of the water of life. There's no money, there's no price to the gospel because the gospel in essence is a gift. How could it ever be connected with something that we must do to earn our salvation? Let us embrace this gospel by faith. Let us embrace what you've accomplished by faith and allow it to go down into our hearts, consume our minds, and give us direction in all we say and do. For we ask it in the name of Jesus and let everyone say, Amen.